major trends in Jewish mysticism, Gershom G. Sholem, fifth lecture, the Zohar, one, the book and its author, one. In the years immediately following 1275, while Abraham Abelathia was expounding his doctrine of prophetic papalism in Italy, a book was written somewhere in the heart of Castile, which was destined to overshadow all other documents of the papalist literature. By the success and the fame it achieved, and the influence it gradually exerted. This was the Sefer HaZohar, our Book of Splendor. Its place in the history of Kabbalism can be gauged from the fact that, alone among the whole of post-Talmudic rabbinical literature, it became a canonical text, which for a period of several centuries actually ranked with the Bible and the Talmud. This unique position, however, was only achieved gradually it took the better part of two centuries to raise the Zohar from the comparative obscurity of its early beginnings to the foremost eminence in Kabbalistic literature. Moreover, there is little doubt that its author, whoever he may have been, had nothing so far reaching in mind. Everything goes to suggest that when writing the Zohar, his primary object was simply to find a congenial expression for his thought. His mind was completely immersed in the world of Kabbalistic thought. But the manner in which he deals with the subject bears the imprint of his own personality. Much as he tried to obscure the personal aspect, as a writer he can claim to have achieved his object. For whatever one may think of the book's merits, it was undeniably a success. The first among the Kabbalists, and later, particularly after the exodus from Spain, among the whole Jewish people for centuries, it stood out as the expression of all that was profoundest and most deeply hidden in the innermost recesses of the Jewish soul. The story is told of Rabbi Phineas of Koretz, a famous Hasidic saint, died about 1791, who was wont to praise and thank God because he had not been born while the Zohar was still unknown to the world. Den der Zohar hat mich der Halten bei Yiddishkeit for the Zohar has helped me to remain a Jew. Such a mark coming from such a man sets one thinking, for the Zohar is perhaps the classical example of that mythical reaction in the heart of Judaism, which I have mentioned in the first lecture. If notwithstanding this fact, a great many Jewish mystics have felt it to be the expression of their deepest emotions and volitions. We shall have to ask ourselves in what the secret of its influence consisted and why the same success was denied to other documents of mystical literature. The Zohar is written in pseudo epigraphic form, almost, one might say, in the form of a mystical novel. In itself, this is not a new departure in style, for the pseudo-epigraphic form had been employed by many previous writers, including Pepalists. Already the authors of the book Bahir made use of the device and spoke through the mouths of older authorities, some of them mere names of fiction, such as Rabbi Amora, is that like the word for Gomorrah? Depending how you spell it, right? Our Rabbi Berhume. But neither before or since has any Kabbalist shown anything like the same delight in letting his fancy elaborate upon the details of his mystification against the background of an imaginative Palestinian setting, the famous Mishnah teacher, Rabbi Simeon ben Yohai is seen wandering about with his son Eliezer, his friends, and his disciples, and discoursing with them on all manners of things human and divine. The literary method employed is modeled on that of the Midrash, that is to say, where possible it avoids theoretical, let alone systematic disquisition preference is given to homiletics, its favorite way. Of putting forward an idea is to work 
at the mystical interpretation of a scriptural saying. As a stylist, the author is inclined to be verbose and long-winded in contrast to the terse and pregnant style of true Midrash, where he employs the pointed language of the ancient sages, he is usually less successful than they in making himself understood. Often several discourses are skillfully worked into the pattern of a longer story. The whole of these shorter or longer discourses, stories, and monologues is assembled in the form of a midrash to the Torah, the Song of Songs, and the Book of Ruth, because its parts are strung on a selection of scriptural sayings chosen at random and as best suited to serve as the vehicles for the writer's own train of thought that is very far from constituting any thing like a real commentary. It remains to be added that from the point of view of style, a highly effective ingredient is supplied by the solemn Aramaic language of the book. I have already said that the author is a homiletical rather than a systematic thinker. In this, however, he is at one with a deeply rooted tendency in Jewish thought. The more genuinely and characteristically Jewish an idea or doctrine is, the more deliberately unsystematic it is. Its principle of construction is not that of a logical system. Even the Mishnah, which comes nearest to presenting an orderly array of thought, reflects this lack of systematization. True, there have been attempts to express Kabbalistic thought in systematic form. Indeed, most of the fundamental ideas found in the Zohar were expressed only a little later in a systematically constructed treatise. Maraketh Ha Eloth, the order of God. But how dry and lifeless are these bare skeletons of thought compared with the flesh and blood of the Zohar. To repeat, the Zohar does not so much develop an idea as it applies it in a homily, and it must be said that the author is distinctly a genius of homiletical thought. Under his touch, the most unpretentious verse, a scripture, acquire an entirely unexpected meaning. As David Newmark, that searching historian of Jewish philosophy, once said, even the critical reader is occasionally plagued by doubts whether the true interpretation of certain passages of the Torah may not, after all, be found here and nowhere else. Frequently, the author loses himself in mystical allegorizations, and not infrequently he becomes abstruse, but again and again a hidden and sometimes awful depth opens before our eyes, and we find ourselves confronted with real and profound insight. His style, tortuous on other occasions, is then lighted up by a magnificent clarity of expression, by a profound symbol of that word into whose hidden regions his mind has so deeply penetrated. I've spoken of an author of the Zohar and therefore assumed his existence, but we must now turn to the question whether there ever was a single author. On this subject, it is still possible to hear widely divergent views. Was there one author or were there several? Was the Zohar the work of many generations, or at any rate, a compilation from more than one author, rather than the work of one man? Do its several parts, of which we shall presently hear more, correspond to different strata or periods? In short, we have to face the crucial questions of higher criticism. What can be said to be known about the compilation of the Zohar, the time of its writing, and the and its author or authors. I have spent many years trying to lay a stable foundation for critical work of this kind, and it seems to me that in so doing I have arrived at a number of incontrovertible conclusions. Research work of this kind has something of the character of a detective story, but fascinating though it is, at least to me, this is not the place to describe it in detail. What I propose to do in this lecture is to give as precise an account as possible of my views on the subject and the manner in which I have arrived at my final conclusions. To begin briefly with the letter, uh, with the latter, I have come to accept in substance the contention of Gratz itself, only the most articulate expressions of a whispered tradition of centuries that the Spanish Kabbalist Moses de Leon must be regarded as the author of the Zohar. The fact that Gratz was, in a surprisingly large number of respects, unable to supply satisfactory proof of his theory has 
facilitated the more general acceptance of the contrary view, very common now, viz. that the Zohar represents only a final edition of writings composed over a long period so long as to make it seem possible that they still contain rudiments of the original mystical thought of Simeon ben Yohai. I may say that when I began to study the Zohar 20 years ago, I also inclined to this view, as it is probably the case with everyone who reads the Zohar for the first time, not to mention those who read it only once in their lives, but in the attempt to base my preference for this explanation on a solid philologic, uh, on solid philological grounds, I gradually became convinced that I had been on the wrong track. Now, one of the things that we find with the Zohar is it's an artificial Aramaic. It's more written in Hebrew, um, trying to include elements of the language that Tonic and such was written in. Um, and it includes elements of um, Portuguese and some uh, some other languages of the uh, Middle Ages and Renaissance period, I guess. The Zohar was written during the Renaissance, wasn't it? Um, two. At first sight, the existence of a multitude of writing of apparently very different character loosely assembled under the title of Zohar, seems to leave no argument against the view that they do, in fact, belong to different writers and different periods. Our first tax, therefore, must be to examine more closely the major components which make up the five full volumes of the Zoharic literature. These may be summarized under the following heads. A, a bulky part which has no specific title and is wholly composed of discursive commentaries on various passages of the Torah, Everything that I have said of the literary character of the Zohar applies fully to this part in which discourses, discussions, and longer or shorter stories are mingled throughout in about the same proportion. B. Sifra de Tsen Utha R. Book of Concealment, a document of only six pages containing a short commentary on passages from the first six chapters of Genesis, which form a single section in the synagogical division of the Torah. Its style is highly oracular and obscure, not a single name being mentioned, and only the briefest allusions are made to the various doctrines, while no explanations of any sort are vouchsafed. Well, you have to get past the individuals and the nations and stuff involved um, and the stories to get at the um, principles that you're trying to teach. I mean, sometimes you can mention all that without that. And if you're not familiar with the story, it's like, I'm oh, respecting Noah and all these other people, but yeah. Um, C. Idra Rabba, our greater assembly. Under this head, the oracular hints and allusions of the preceding chapter are now fully developed and explained. Simeon ben Yohai assembles his faithful followers in order to reveal to them the mysteries hitherto hidden from their eyes. Each in turn rises to speak and is praised by the master. The composition of this part is architecturally perfect. The totality of the speeches constitutes a systematic whole. Insofar as this expression can be at all applied to anything in the Zohar, as the unraveling of the mystery pr progresses, the participants are increasingly overcome by ecstasy, and of the final dramatic apotheosis, three of them die in a state of ecstatic trance. D. Idra Zuta, or Lesser Assembly. Here the death of Simeon ben Yohai is described in the same dramatic fashion, and the lengthy speech is quoted in which he sums up the mysteries of the great Idra, at the same time introducing certain novel specula uh, specifications. E. Idra de de Mashkana, i.e. assembly on the occasion of a lecture in connection with the Torah section concerning the tabernacle. This chapter follows in its composition. The example of the Idra Rabbah but deals with different questions, particularly those relating to the mysticism of prayer. Um, Mashkana is the, um, 
It has the quality or it possesses the presence. Is what that word means, I guess. Um, F. Hakaloth, a description of the seven palaces of light, perceived by the soul of the devout after his death, or by the inner vision of the mystic during prayer. The same description recurs in another passage, but at five times its length, with many new and picturesque embellishments, particularly of the angelology. Um, my series on the tarot of the dead um, is mostly what you probably call Jewish angelology, but I, of course, haven't limited myself to say, well, you must be Jewish or, uh, you know, um, or hold any specifically Jewish doctrines. It's just, you know, where a lot of it comes from. G. Vraza de Razin, i.e. Secretum Scriptorum. Here we find separate pieces on physiognomy and chiromancy, evidently two parallel attempts to deal with the subject in different ways. One chapter is completely anonymous. The other employs the customary stage setting with Simon ben Yohai and his pupils in the foreground. H. Sava, the old man, a romantic story centering on the speech made by a mysterious old man who, under the beggarly appearance of a donkey driver, reveals himself before Sim Simeon ben Yohai's pupils as one of the greatest Kabbalist a literary fiction which is also employed in many of the tales of which part A is compounded. The speaker's elaborately styled discourse deals mainly with the mysteries of the soul, the roots of which he traces in the legal code of the Torah concerning the treatment of the Hebrew slave. I, Yenuka, the child, the story of an infant prodigy and its own discourse on the mysteries of the Torah and the saying of grace after meals, like other child prodigies mentioned in part A, this child is discovered by the pupils of Simeon ben Yohai after its own parents and relatives have come to regard it as incapable of learning. Well, you still take care of children, regardless of that, anyway. K. Rav. Methiva, that uh, Rav Methiv, yeah, Rav Methivtha, the head of the academy. Uh, okay, a description of a vision, a visionary journey through paradise undertaken by members of the circle, and a discourse by one of the heads of the celestial academy on the destinies of the soul, particularly in the other world. L. Sitra Torah, secrets of the Torah allegorical and mystical interpretations of some passages of the Torah with a tendency towards theosophy and mystical psychology, part anonymous, part in accordance with the usual style of legend. M. Mathnithin, i.e. Mishnahs and Tosefta, these chapters show a deliberate attempt to follow the characteristically laconic style of the 2nd century Halakhic compendia known as Mishnah and Tosefta, though, of course, on a purely Kabbalistic base, they are apparently meant to serve as, a brief, as brief introductions to the lengthy speeches and discussions on part a based upon the sections of the Torah, just as the Mishnah, with its brief passages, serves as an introduction to the discussions of the Talmud. The mystical Mishnahs are anonymous and written in a high-flown style. They seem to express some sort of revelation of heavenly voices. N. Zohar to the Song of Songs is purely Kabbalistic commentary to the first verses of the Song of Solomon, with numerous digressions from the central train of thought. O. Kav Ha Medah the mystical standard of measure, a profound and searching interpretation of the meaning of Deuteronomy 6, 4, the Shema, Israel, P, Sethra, Athioth, Secrets of the Letters, a Kabbalistic monologue by Rabbi Simeon on the letters which occur in the names of God and on the origins of creation. Q, a commentary for which no title is supplied on Ezekiel's vision of the Merkabah. R, Midrash, Ha, Nilam, 
i.e. mystical midrash on the Torah, here we encounter not only Simeon ben Yohai and his pupils, but also a host of other authorities who, like the others, are either legendary figures or Talmudic teachers of the 2nd, 3rd, and 4th centuries. For further details, see below. S. Midrash Ha Nilam on the Book of Ruth, a close parallel to the one just mentioned. Both are partly written in Hebrew. T. Reya Mehemna, the faithful shepherd, a Kabbalistic interpretation of the commandments and prohibitions of the Torah. U. Takun Zohar, a new commentary on the first section of the Torah, divided into 70 chapters, each of which begin with a new interpretation of the word of the Torah. Bereshith, in print, this part constitutes a separate bibliographic uh, a separate bibliographical unit. V. Further additions to the last mention are text written in the same style, e.g., a new commentary to Ezekiel's Merkbah, etc. Uh, these are the main components of the Zohar, i.e., all except a few brief texts of little importance and some forged parts, imitations of the main work written at a much later time and only partly incorporated into the printed editions. I guess sometimes it's like a 23rd volume or something, right? In the published volumes of the Zohar, these writings cover about 2,400 closely printed pages, of which only about a half, chiefly the material headed under A and H to K, are contained in the English translation of the Zohar by Harry Sperling and Maurice Simon, published in five volumes a few years ago. Um, upon closer examination... Of these writings themselves and the relation to each other, it becomes plain that they must be divided into two groups. One includes the first 18 items of our list, among which, however, the two sections of the Midrash, Ha Nilam, occupy a special position. The last three items form a second group, which differs radically from the first of the 18 items which make up the first group and may be said to constitute what is, to all intents and purposes, the real Zohar. It can be definitely asserted that they are the work of one author. Now, there are some of those phrases that people get wrong because they get it wrong, but sometimes you really mean for all intensive purposes, and sometimes you really mean taking something for granted. Um, I wouldn't mind having a collection of all the types of granite in the world, you know, as long as I don't have to have you know, what, 50, uh, 50 different boulders in the yard? You know, um, it is neither true that they were written at different periods or by different authors, nor is it possible to detect different historical layers within the various parts themselves. Here and there, a sentence or a few words may have been added at some latter date, but in the main, the distinction so popular with some writers between so-called authentic parts and subsequent interpolations does not bear serious investigation. Well, it depends on if they're ordered or not, right? Um, the truth is that the general... Well, I mean, you know, the group of boulders, but anyways. Um, the truth is that the general impression left by these writings is one of surprising uniformity despite their wealth of color. The physiognomy of their author is more or less clearly reflected in all of them, and the picture which emerges is that of a distinctive personality with all its strength and weaknesses. Both as a thinker and as a writer, evidence of this identity is to be found in the language of the book, in its literary style, and last but not least, in the doctrine which it sets forth. Uh, three, the Aramaic language of all these 18 sections is throughout the same and throughout it, displays the same individual peculiarities. This is all the more important because it is not in any sense a living language which Simeon ben Yuhai and his friends in the first half of the second century of the common era in Palestine might conceivably have spoken. The Aramaic of the Zohar is a purely artificial affair, a literary language employed by a writer who obviously knew no other Aramaic than that of certain Jewish literary documents. 
and who fashioned his own style in accordance with definite subjective criteria. The expectation expressed by some scholars that philological investigation would reveal the older, uh, the older strata of the Zohar has not been borne out by actual research. Throughout these writings, the spirit of medieval Hebrew, specifically the Hebrew of the 13th century of the Common Era, is transparent behind the Aramaic facade. It is a further important point that all the resultant peculiarities of the language in which the Zohar is written and which set it off from spoken Aramaic dialects are to be found equally in all of its various parts. It is true that the style shows a great many variations. It runs all the way from serene beauty to labored tortuousness, from the inflated rhetoric to the most paltry simplicity, and from excessive verbosity to laconic and enigmatic brevity, all depending on the subject and the mood of the author. But these stylistic variations all play upon a single theme and never obscure the essential identity of the mind behind them. It remains to be added that the author's vocabulary is extremely limited, so that one never escapes a feeling of surprise at his ability to express so much with the aid of so little. In general, the language of the Zohar may be described as a mixture of the Aramaic dialects found in the two books with which the author was above all familiar, the, Bal the Babylonian Talmud and the Targum Ankelas, the old Aramaic translation of the Torah. Well, the earliest writings of the of Tonic and the side text were all in what was called at the time Aramea, so... In particular, the grammatical forms of the latter are given in preference over all others. The author apparently regarded the language of the Targum on Kalas as the dialect which was spoken in Palestine around a hundred of the Common Era. Nevertheless, linguistic elements from the Babylonian Talmud occur in almost every line. Now, one of the entities that, uh, you know, um, Apollonius died about that time enabling some of the writings about Paul and three of the Gospels to be written after that. So it's interesting that they chose that period um, to represent. It was noteworthy that the Palestinian Talmud had, has exercised virtually no influence on the language of the Zohar, although elements of it are traceable in some of its contents. Evidently, it was not one of the author's standard books of reference. To take an example, the terminology of the discussion on questions of exegesis and halakha is wholly derived from the Babylonian Talmud, albeit not copied literally, but enriched by certain stylistic novelties. This motley display of different styles is equally evident in the use of pronouns and particles, and in the employment of verbal forms and endings of nouns. In some cases, the verbs used are those of the Targum Jerushalmi. Frequently, the various forms appear quite indiscriminately in the same sentence. As a result, every page of the Zohar displays a rainbow picture of linguistic eclecticism, the constituent elements of which, however, remain constant throughout. The syntax is extremely simple, almost monotonous, and wherever there are differences between Hebrew and Aramaic, the construction is distinctly Hebrew. Syntactical peculiarities of medieval Hebrew recur in Aramaic disguise, as in the case of every artificial language, a characteristic note is introduced by misunderstandings and grammatical misconstructions. Thus, the author, in many cases, confuses the verb stems of kal with those of pal and afel, and vice versa. He employs entirely wrong forms of ethpal and gives a transitive meaning to verbs in ethpal. He mixes up finite verb forms chiefly in the main cases where the endings of the participle are tacked on the perfect. 
and his use of prepositions and conjunctions uh, and conjunctions is often quite preposterous. The same is also true with his vocabulary. One frequently encounters the Avo Hebrew expressions, particularly from the language of the philosophers in Aramaic disguise. Thus, in a hundred places one finds for nevertheless are despite the word em kol da, which is nothing but a metaphrase of the Hebrew word introduced by the Timonid family of translators in conscious imitation of the Arabic uh, of the Arabic adverb and gradually naturalized in the 13th century. Some recurrent expressions are simply Arabic, like the word tan in the sense of goading an animal, are Spanish like gardena, guardian, the Zohar's standing expression for mitigating or allaying the stern judgment is coined from a Spanish phrase. In a number of cases, the author chooses the wrong metaphrases, i.e. he attributes to the Aramaic roots all the meanings that the derivatives of the corresponding Hebrew words may carry, irrespective of the actual Aramaic usage. Simple misunderstandings of the expressions which he found in his literary sources also play a part. Many words have a meaning of their own in the Zohar that they could not have had in any spoken Aramaic dialect. A study of the manner in which the author has extracted from these new and often quite fantastic meanings is not not infrequently throws new light on his sources. To take a few instances, the Talmudic word for an Arab becomes a term for a Jewish donkey driver. What is there a word for ship? is here a word for treasure house. The same word in which the Talmud signifies strength comes to mean also the mother's breast or lap. The word for thirst now signifies clarity. The verb to lend somebody something now means to accompany someone, and so on through a long list of cases in all of which the author's method and in his misunderstandings is on the whole one and the same. He stretches the meaning of ancient words in an entirely arbitrary fashion and frequently employs them for the purpose of paraphrasing mystical termini technicae. He also likes to play on double meanings used by, uh, by using ambiguous expressions in which the original and the secondary meaning give an opaque character to the word. He is careful to avoid expressions which appear to have too much of a modernistic sound, such as Kabbalah and Sephiroth. In their place, he employs paraphrases, often with a fine absence of awareness that modern forms of thought are perceptible, even in archaic disguise. And one of the things you find about tonic is that about a quarter of the words, you don't have living meanings. You can only look at the particles of it and speak accordingly like that and some of the Aram, uh, some of the semitic words in the first place are very wide in their ability to